Um, okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, while we have more people to continue to join the room, um, I just wanted to thank everybody uh, for joining us today at the SingHealth U NUS Global Health Institute Global Health Seminar Series 2023-24. Um, um, this is the second of our third seminar series that we are hosting, um, themed around the topic of um, AI as well as big data in global health. Um, if you missed our previous seminar with Dr. Gavin Tan, you can find the recording on the SCGHI YouTube channel alongside all our other past uh, webinar recordings. Um, my name is Evelyn, um, and I'm an Associate Consultant at the National Cancer Centre Singapore, as well as a clinical instructor and faculty member with the SDGHI um, uh, as part, um, in charge of the Global Health Seminar Series. Um, just some quick housekeeping before we start. Um, you should be able to see a question and answer box on your Zoom bars. Um, please use that to let us know if you have any questions for our speaker today. And we'll have some time at the end of the session where we will try to answer as many as your questions from that Q&A box. Now, today's webinar is entitled Big Data and AI in Head and Neck Cancer um, Radiotherapy Planning. And we're very excited to have Associate Professor Melvin Chua with us to, uh, this morning. Uh, Dr. Chua is a clinician scientist at the National Cancer Center Singapore and Duke NUS Medical School and principal investigator of the Precision Radiotherapeutic and Oncology Program, supported by the NMRC's uh, Clinician Scientist Award. He is also the head of the department and senior consultant for head and neck and thoracic cancers, Division of Radiation Oncology, and the director of the Data and Computational Science Hub at National Cancer Center. His research focuses on phase two, phase three clinical trials in NPC, uh, nasal, pharyngeal, and prostate cancers, as well as he runs a laboratory that's also involved in data science and omics um, analytics that help with therapeutic and biomarker discovery for these cancer types. Um, he currently co-leads the Singapore NPC Large Collaborative Grant, where he leads the platform trials on individualized treatment for advanced NPC and is also the chair of the ESCO Asia Pacific Regional Council and the program committee chair of the ESCO Breakthrough Meeting 2024. Um, so with that, I'd like to hand over the time to Dr. Chua. Um, at the end of this whole seminar, we will also ask for feedback. So everyone do um, stay around and we can talk a little bit more subsequently about our Global Health Seminar series. Um, so without any further ado, um, Dr. Chua, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you, um, Dr. Wong. Uh, Glenn and everyone from the Global Health Institute for inviting me. Um, the it's it's I'm, I'm I'm extremely thrilled to be able to speak to you all um, to a very global audience actually uh, this uh, afternoon um, for on on a topic that you know perhaps it's not just focused on hidden neck cancers but transverses you know several other cancers um, and you know speaks to the whole theme of big data, maybe with a bit of artificial intelligence or machine learning, whichever way you call it. And with the overarching goal of trying um, to drive towards precision oncology, I think radiation is you know, one such tool in this movement towards precision oncology. So as if that's introduced, uh, I'm Dr. Melvin Chua. I'm a radiation oncologist specializing in head and neck cancers and GU cancers. And I practice from the National Cancer Center, Singapore. These are my disclosures. I'll discuss some of them in my talk today, um, pertaining to PVMAD and our collaborations with uh, U2 Cloud. But I thought I'll start with my team. And I think it's important to showcase the people that's really the soul and the engine behind all of this work that I'm going to share in the next you know, 40, 45 minutes or so. And the team, the architect architecture of the team, um, is divided into the different domains, transversing clinical trials and data analytics to omics. And then, you know, there's a cross pollination with the translational therapeutics team. And they are led by the different individuals as you see in this photo here. And I call it this team together with uh, Professor Suki Chi, who is the founding director of the National Cancer Center Singapore. Um, well, you know, I would like to also acknowledge the funding support that we get, both from industry, governmental, as well as um, philanthropy. And the, the, the scope of, the, of our program really focuses on therapeutics, as well as nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which I will share uh, to some extent uh, subsequently. And the other group of people that I would like to acknowledge are the extensive list of local uh, and 
overseas collaborators and all named here. And I think the thing to point out is the multidisciplinary nature of all the collaborators, you know, across radiation oncology, medical oncology, as well as surgical oncology, you know, the, the local collaborators, uh, including scientists uh, from the Genome Institute of Singapore. And I think over the next part of my talk, you'll hear about different segments of work that we have pursued over the years in collaboration with our overseas collaborator, uh, primarily a, a ton of investigators from the SUNY Edison Cancer Center the uh, University Cancer Center, which is really a powerhouse for nasal pharyngeal carcinoma. And how through that and several other connections, we have also um, developed a reach to several industry collaborators that I showcase here. And you hear them, hear me speak briefly about the different uh, spectrums of projects that we have with them. And so with that, I'll sort of segue to the outline of my talk today. And I'll largely focus on a few different parts in terms of where I see big data being applied in hidden neck cancers, um, and then segue into the role of AI in automation as well as data aggregation, showcasing some of the projects that we are currently involved in. And so we'll start with the impact of data in precision oncology. And I think this slide sort of summarizes it all. Needless to say, you know, we've seen a wealth of data, especially with the onset of next generation sequencing, the acknowledgement of the depth of clinical and omics data that we collect. And all of this are meant to inform us on the phenotypes of patients and actually how we should treat them. Now, of course, the, the reality is that the, behind this big data tsunami is this cognizant that the amount of information that we collect goes beyond the human cognitive capacity to be able to understand you know, where, how to make the best use of the data, how this informs the top processes in terms of how we treat our patients. And I think there is indeed a gap from data to knowledge application, as I have indicated in one of my points here. And so the, the multiple domains of data uh, it's clearly something we recognize. And even going even beyond genomics, the field has really, with the onset of several new technologies today, been able to look across different spectrums of omics pertaining to the transcriptome, the proteome, being able to profile deeply the, and, and accurately capture the phenotype of the cancer. Now, what, notwithstanding the fact that we, apart from electronic health records data that we have, the abundance of imaging data, all those potentially serve to help us understand the clinical phenotypes and perhaps help to then translate some of this information back to the laboratory to help us design mechanistic studies to perhaps understand treatment response and sensitivity to new medication. And so with that, this whole multiomics data is intended to not just help improve our processes in the clinic, but also to be, serve as an engine for translational and basic research. And so this allows me to then sort of talk briefly about some of the competency and capacity we have since at the new National Cancer Center, which we've moved in about the last six months. And briefly, the research in, our, in, in the new NCCS largely focuses on two segments. Of course, the engine of the and soul of the research in NCCS largely focuses on the clinical trials and epidemiological sciences. And this is led by um, Professor Daniel Tan, who is a thoracic oncologist. And his interest really focuses on early drug development as well as translational science in lung cancer. But the, the key role of this research division is intended to help facilitate and catalyze a lot of research pertaining across phase one to late phase uh, clinical trials. And this allows us to also be part into a national effort called the Singapore Translational Cancer Consortium that's intended to help catalyze research both in clinical trials as well as in translational science, and more recently in population health. Now, behind that, there's also a group of you know, very dynamic 
clinician scientists like myself, along with several others, as well as basic scientists that's intended to help really drive translational research to help enhance the understanding of what we see in the clinic, as well as from base of samples that we collect on clinical trials. And then, you know, to apply this in both basic science as well as translation, translational um, biology, and hoping that the two of them will then be able to help inform future trial designs. So this, both engines, this core pillars are intended across talk between them. And they're going to support several of the large programs that I showcase here. I think at the NCCS, we've been very fortunate to have been able to lead several large uh, collaborative research um, spreading across viral associated cancers, lung cancers, Asian specific liver cancers. And just for the purpose of today's talk, I'm going to really sort of focus on this new program that we started in last year on nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which is a, a very unique Asian specific disease. So this map basically highlights my point. Nasopharyngeal carcinoma, or MPC, as we most of us who treat this disease affectionately knows it, is a unique disease that's linked to a virus. And as a result, as a consequence, we see a specific histo histomorphological phenotype um, among, the cancers, uh, among the MPCs that we see in Singapore. It also has a unique geographical distribution. As you see in the circles I've highlighted, but if you just look at China alone, there is a vast disparity between the incidence of MPC in Northern China versus Southern China, where we see approximately 30 to 50 uh, per 100,000 um, age standardized incidence rate, um, which makes then MPC very endemic. Now, a few years ago, we decided to then, you know, together with Sun Yat-sen Cancer Center, in collaboration with the company Yitu Cloud, to come together to try to build a large repository of nasopharyngeal carcinoma database. And the motivation behind that was we know that in Sun Yat-sen Cancer Center, they see approximately 6,000 to 8,000 new patients per year, whereas this is also um, a very common hair neck cancer that we see at the NCCS, I'm sure likewise for the other local institutions. Just to give an idea, locally, about among the hair neck cancer patients that we see per year, MPC dominates about 50% of all cases. So it is a fairly common disease. Now to add to that, it is a disease, a cancer that affects patients in the prime of their social economic activity between 30 to 50. And if you look at the mortality, all cause mortality across all age group, MPC actually in fact ranks as a top 10. And one of the reasons why is because the majority of patients presents at an advanced stage. So with that in mind, you know, we decided to, to collaborate with Sunyasen Center to then pull our clinical repository. And the idea is then, number one, to see if we can deep dive into some of the clinical and molecular prognostic markers to then help think about how this may inform and enhance um, the way we treat our patients. So that would be the first goal in terms of energizing the clinical support pathway. But at the same time, separately, to build this knowledge bank, which then allows us to leverage on at a few levels. With the clinical warehouse, we are then able to then prospectively consent patients um, to collect their biospecimens, to then build a parallel molecular data bank. And with all that put together, the idea is that it may allow us to then look at the answer clinical questions that often plague us in the clinic, see if any of this can actually launch, be a launch pad to new clinical trials design, as well as new drug discovery. So for example, like in point two, a case in point, you know, based from this clinical warehouse, we're able to extract real-time data to then help us understand you know, very nuanced phenotypes based on longitudinal treatment response that we've since published on that. And then all this, I'm proud to say that from all these discoveries, it's actually allowed us to design, you know, contemporary clinical trials that could actually help answer some of the questions pertaining to implementation of precision medicine in MPC. Now, one of the motivation behind this is this tight intricacy between MPC 
and EBV, which is a virus known to be a strong carcinogen over several years now. In fact, the discovery of the virus dates back more than 50 years, and among all the cancers that it has been since been associated with, MPC was the first cancer that was discovered. And this is kudos to work led by Professor An uh, Anthony Epstein and the late Yvonne Barr, who were one of the first few scientists to identify the EBV virus in the tumor cell. And here you see this electron micrograph where you identify this circular virus fragments that exists in the episomal form in the cytoplasm. And so with that, it led to this idea that potentially this you know, EBV-associated MPC, this tumor cells may actually shed. And as it shed and lies, may release this viral fragments into the peripheral circulation, which then allows us to capture you know, the presence of this, viral, uh, this virus DNA as a biomarker. And so briefly, how this liquid biopsy work is that per 10 mils of blood draw, you may get about four mils of plasma. And this circling DNA, or in this instance, this EBV DNA fragments exist in the plasma and are typically highly fragmented. They have a half-life of about four hours or less, and the clearance is primarily through enzymes in the blood or through the liver and kidneys. But kudos to work led by scientists from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, Professor Dennis Lo and Professor Alan Chan. And they are pioneers in this field because they were one of the few, first few scientists that actually developed this technology intended for detect, detection of trisomy 21. And that's now commercially known as a harmony test. And Dennis, as well as Alan, realized that there was, there was utility of this test in, the, in MPC. And so in one of their work published more than 30 years ago now, or 20, 20 odd years ago now, they were able to show that the presence of EBV DNA correlates with the diagnosis of MPC. It clears at the end of definitive treatment, which is real therapy or chemo real therapy. The re-emergence of it correlates with relapses, and in this case, both distant and local relapse. And so since then, this work has been multiply validated several times over. And I'm proud to say that it's through this pivotal work that has then allowed us to, to have this clinical test to be used in a clinic and across several settings. And so this is one of such examples of how we use the test in the clinic today. So for years, we've been collecting EBV DNA when patients come to see us for the first time in the clinic, and it is done as part of a routine staging test. So in collaboration with Sunyasin Hospital, we then looked at a 10,000 patient cohort, and this was work started about six years ago now in 2017, which we published about two years ago, where we looked at um, the role of EBV DNA as a biomarker to complement conventional TNM staging for pronostication of survival. So here we did an internal as well as external validation, including looking at a quarter of patients from a randomized trial, which I wouldn't sort of touch on in detail here. But the point was, the first thing we did was to identify, because we had this large database, what was the optimal threshold to actually define what would be a low risk or high risk patient. Now risk here refers to the risk of relapse. And in nasal pharyngeal carcinoma, patients typically relapse distally in the lungs, bones, and liver. So that's the predominant pattern of relapse. So the idea here is that with EBV DNA, is there a way we can actually define for stage three or stage four patient who would be at high risk or versus low risk for distant relapse? And therefore allows us to think about the optimal treatment intensity in terms of systemic therapy to combine with radiation. So if you just look at the plot here, looking at more than 10,000 patients, we're able to define one thing, which is number one, the linear relationship between EBV DNA and hazard ratio for death. So on the y-axis you see here, this is the hazard ratio for overall survival. And you appreciate that after a certain cutoff, then you see this initial lag. And then once a certain cutoff, then EB, the relationship between EBV and risk of death is largely linear, as you could expect. 
But when we look across all the endpoints, it was coincidental. It was a coincidence as well. So we found that around about 2,000 copies was where we could define the patients where their risk of any event exits beyond one. So as you could imagine, from a statistical point of view, anything above one would then imply that there's a higher risk of a relapse or death occurring. Now, one would argue that, okay, 2,000, you know, could, could we go with something higher? And so we also perform a sensitivity analysis, which you see here, whereby depending on whether you cut off at 2,000, 20,000, 200,000, the hazard ratio largely remains stable at around two. Um, but the point here is that as you go with a higher threshold, then the segmentation of patients become a bit imbalanced. So as you would expect, patients, with, if you look at 20,000 copies as a cutoff, then you're really looking at about a quarter of patients. So how you want to shift this goalpost really depends on what is the clinical application they were looking at. But a key point is this. This is like a color code, the way I, I wanted to showcase how we thought about you know, incorporating EBV DNA with TNM. So we know that TNM performs quite well in terms of certifying patients for risk of death. And so instead of making things complicated, like a multivariable model or whatnot, this is work done together with uh, Dr. Tan Zihui, who is one of the biostatisticians from uh, NCCS CTE, where we came up with an intuitive system. So we use a cutoff of 2,000 copies, and then anything less than 2,000 or more than 2,000 will be considered low versus high. And the point here is that using the adjusted hazard ratio model, we showed that apart from T1N0, which is stage one, for so every T and N category, so T2, N0, T2, N1, based on the EBV DNA of low versus high, the patient's risk essentially increases. And so just to showcase to you what it means by giving these fine risk groups instead of the usual conventional four risk groups, you straight away appreciate that even among low risk patients, say for example, stage two, T2, N1, based on the EBV DNA copy number, we could get a difference of about 5%, so five-year overall survival rate, and potentially 10% difference between the AHR group 2A versus 3. And then if you look at the high-risk groups between 3 to 5, you could again identify groups of patients where the survival rates differ between 15%. So I think this is a starting point to then allow us to think about how do we precisely risk stratify, and then Think about the intensification strategies for patients in a low risk group and then intensification strategies for patients in a high risk group. And so that was how we thought about you know, fitting all this in together, where although of course you can compound these models in many different ways, but just starting with a very simple pre-treatment baseline model. And you can see here again the EBV DNA incorporated with TNM model versus the conventional AGCC model, then use this to then be the template for multi-center validation and eventually you know, segue into decision support. And this is just one such example where the point here that was, I'm trying to make here in this very sort of colorful and complex slide is that depending on the way you certify patients based on EBV low versus high, the different N categories, then you layer in the different T categories, you would appreciate that for someone who is T4 N0, for example, would otherwise be treated as stage four nose cancer based on all these characteristics. In fact, their risk may not be as high as someone who is a true stage four, a T1, T4, N3 with high EBV DNA. And then between risk three versus risk five, you see a almost about 15 to 20% survival difference. And so with that, there's a whole suite of treatment options that are available. And this, the, the intent for this is with the real world elements that we collect, we can then appreciate that for the respective risk groups based on the different treatments that, that the patient receive, then what are the odds of survival? And I find this extremely powerful because if you imagine having this tool in the clinic, that if a patient who is a 30 year old, 40 year old, who is at the point of their career, you know, instead of telling them something rudimentary and generic that if you have stage three nose cancer, this is what I want to treat you with. The idea is that at every respective center, based on the data that you have collected in your local institution, 
then you're able to perform the same exercise whereby if depending on which file markers you have and here in mpc you can in fact create several layers looking at tumor bulk as well as other clinical and biochemical parameters then come up with fine risk groups like this and then be able to inform the patients that hey depending on whether you're at risk two or risk three if you have chemo radiation versus real therapy alone you get about a seven percent difference and then allow this to be a mutual bilateral decision making process between the patient and the physician you know this is by far a far more powerful tool i think when it comes to you know translate uh, transferring patient information and i think this is certainly the way forward and we are looking at implementing this in the clinic today and so this is one of such tools that was created for the Sun Yat-sen Cancer Center and as i alluded to earlier there are also other markers that are known to be prognostic markers in nasopharyngeal carcinoma, like your know, age, smoking history, as well as some of the biochemical parameters. And with that, then for every patient based on board categories, you then be able to precisely and, and be very granularly delineate what is their survival chance based on the um, different stage risk group, uh, depending on the, the biomarker results that we, that we get. So that is just the first part of it. Now, the other thing that would also allow us to do, which we wanted to look at was, of course, EBV DNA, one could argue, is not a technology that's available to everywhere else in the world. So in collaboration with another institution in China, and this is work led by one of our ex data scientists, Adam Lin Sim, and one of my ex-fellow, Huang Luo, where we decided to look at like the dehydrogenase, um, which is a, you know, a common enzyme, a test that we do commonly in the clinic. And here, instead of just looking at a single time point, we decided to look at kinetics of response as an associator of systemic therapy response. And in this instance, we focus on patients with recurrent metastatic MPC. And so this plot just want to summarize to you the dirtiness of real-world data that we use. Now, of course, in the earlier example, I showed you a very elegant um, data set which then allowed us to come up with a fairly robust model with about 70 odd percent uh, prediction accuracy. Now, in the real world um, data, like in this case, recurrent metastatic MPC, for those who treat such disease, you know that patients do drop out, you know, either due to toxicity or prog progression or loss to follow up. And that's the same thing that we found in this data set of 158 patients, where over time we see a substantial data attrition due to multiple factors. The color codes here annotate the response to treatment. So green refers to partial response, stable disease is cyan, and then progressive disease is annotated as orange. Now, remember this color code here. So the thing was we looked across different type of parameters. We look at absolute numbers, we look at absolute time, uh, numbers at time points, but in the end, Adeline decided to look at ratio. So here we show you both the absolute number as well as the ratio. So basically the LDH level at that point in time relative to the LDH ratio preceding to the time point. And you could see that while the absolute levels across all the different cycles kind of is linked to whether you're likely to have a partial response. So case in point, if the LDH is lower, then it correlates with partial response, whereas a higher level of LDH would then imply progressive disease. But if you then look at ratio, it will seem that the data points are a lot tighter. It might be a more stable sort of statistical in the index for us to use when it comes to prediction. But again, we see the same trend, whereby if the ratio is below one, then most of these patients would likely have a partial response. Whereas if the ratio is above one, then this will correlate with progressive disease. And so I think that the, the earlier examples are case in point that in fact, the breadth of data that we collect, both molecular as well as, you know, typical biochemical indices, if we know how to use it well, could actually help inform several of the things that we do in the clinic. And I think this sort of speaks to the importance of actually starting about, you know, curating real world data and building this, you know, a robust repository. And I think we all acknowledge that real world data is dirty, but case in point is that working with, you know, 
experienced analysts, depending on the question you want to answer, we could essentially transform or just curate data, um, a very unique set of data that may help give us clues on things that we'll actually bring to the clinic or translate to the clinic very easily. You know, beyond thinking about novel tools like next generation sequencing, which may take um, years to come for some places and then multiple stakeholder collaborations. So I hope that gives inspiration to the diverse audience that we have, you know, including people from developed ecosystems to low and middle income ecosystems. And so this allows me to then pivot nicely into my next part of my talk, which really sort of touches on the role of AI, artificial intelligence, in facilitating some of the tasks that we do in the clinic. And the first thing I'll speak on is the role of automation. And one of the things that came that inspired us to look into this was as a radiation oncologist that specializes in head and neck cancer, we spend a lot of time contouring. So this is an example um, of a the contour of a nasopharyngeal, a patient with nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So in this instance, we use both the CT, MRI, and this day's PET scan, and we fuse all the images together to essentially delineate the tumor. Now, this is a very important process because that sets the template for the subsequent expansions to include intermediate or subclinical risk of spread. And if we don't do this well, then that's when patients suffer from marginal relapses and so forth. But the limitation of this is that the delineation process is highly heterogeneous, even among experienced radiation oncologists. Because ultimately, how do you recognize what is normal? Well, normal. And as a case in point, if you just look at this MRI here, how do you know where the tumor boundary sits? Did it actually invade the longest coli muscle? Is the bone here involved? Versus on the contralateral side, is it actually benign? So I think all this highlights the difficulties. And it's not trying to say that AI could replace you, the human eye or the human experience, but could we somehow make this more homogeneous? And with that, that you know, this essentially highlights the point, some of the points I, I alluded to, you know, the complexity of the contouring and could you know, computer vision or complex neural networks that is quite mature now in this day and age in terms of you know, analyzing imaging data sets, could it actually help you know, accelerate or enhance some of this task that we do? And so this led to this work, again, that started around the same time when we were collaborating with Sydney Sun Cancer Center on aggregating large real-world data sets. And this was one of the first um, 3D CNN that we built. And to emphasize another point that I may have missed out when I, when I shared earlier, was if most of us who did who, you know who have done an MRI scan for a patient, you know that you know there are multiple sequences, and in MPC when we contour, we actually utilize and leverage on every single uh, sequence, including the pre and post contrast as well as the T2 weighted sequence. So when we build this model, we ignore the PET data, but we included all the sequences to essentially help develop this tool. And the purpose was to actually contour um, the gross tumor volume or the gross tumor target uh, in nasopharyngeal carcinoma patients. And so this is one of the things I wanted to showcase. And I think this is a very powerful image. So alluding to the point I said earlier, if you look at the contour on the left, these are manual contours performed by eight experienced radiation oncologists. And so each color code denotes one radiation oncologist contour. And while you say that arguably most of them are kind of similar, but there is a stark heterogeneity between the red line that's contoured by one radiation oncologist versus the light brown line that's contoured by another radiation oncologist. And so this basically highlights my point about the great heterogeneity, even among radiation oncologists who treat more than 100 NPCs per year. Then what we did in this study was we then gave them, gave them a six months washout and then deliver them a contour that was drawn by the AI and then tell them to edit the contour. And hence why we coined this as AI assisted contour. And now the, when we did this work, this really predates several of the other sort of similar contouring tools or studies that we've seen today. But when we saw this result, it was certainly very compelling because straight away you appreciate 
the greater homogeneity between the different oncologies just by this simple exercise. And so apart from that, of course, we see the time savings, the gross time savings about you know, half, and then the DSE value refers to the, you know, the consistency index relative, between, relative to a contour that is drawn by a uh, expert, which is then defined as ground truth. But across all the eight radiation oncologies, you can see pretty much an improvement uh, you know, for the majority of them. So I think it highlights a few things, you know, apart from time savings. But I think it just makes things a lot more consistent. So if we then think about study implementation across multiple centers, multiple countries, I think a tool like that will be extremely powerful. And just to show you a quick video of how this can be done. Um, so this is a tool now that we then take on a more enhanced version working together with PVMAT. And this is the MRI image. This is the CT simulation template. Um, you know, I pardon that this whole tool was developed in Chinese because it's meant for the Chinese community, but we've since come out working with them, come up with an English version uh, to be used for the international sites. And, you know, if you essentially click the Gaussian volume and within seconds, the AI delivers a contour. But, you know, again, it is not by far the most accurate, but it serves as a template, then allow the investigator to tweak it. So we can then further go on to generate this um, clinical target volumes which I alluded to, which are expanded margins annotating where are the possible subclinical spread. So then this allows us to then, as radiation oncologists, fine tune these contours, and then typically we will prescribe differential doses to these volumes. And so I think the whole idea is that with such tool, it could not only allow, um, you know, facilitate and you know, quicken the way we perform this task, but I think it certainly makes everything a lot more homogeneous and less uh, reduced into individual variability. So we've then since gone forward and performed wider studies. And here, this is another collaboration working with Envision, where we then have multiple sites, including Hong Kong, Finland, and Netherlands. And here, we call this study, the Harmony study, which is head and neck rapid um, auto-segmentation tool, a multi-clinic evaluation study. And the motivation here is that we didn't want to develop a tool that is based on a unique data set from a specific hospital. Here we had a tool that's fairly mature. And the idea is that we use this tool to then apply ubiquitously across the participating centers and then really robustly test what is the real will application and the utility of this tool in terms of helping the clinician do his task. And the application here is we use it to contour the hair neck lymph nodes. Now, for most of us who treat hair neck cancers, we know that this cancer typically like to spread to the lymph nodes. For nasal pharyngeal carcinoma, these tumors tend to spread bilaterally and involve several of the lymph node stations comprehensively. So with that, you know, it can be a very tedious task to essentially delineate the target they want to treat in the neck. And so the idea of this tool is that does this actually accelerate this task? At the same time, because the hair and neck is a very complex region, we do contour multiple organs at risk, like the salivary gland, the oral cavity, the eye, where in the planning exercise, we'll try to then make sure that we maximally deliver those, to the targets that we're going after, and then to the area that we want to span, like the organs at risk, then these areas will get a reduced dose. So this is a very important task. So the idea of this study is to then test accuracy, efficiency gain, and the inter-observer variation. But the key thing is that we did not redevelop a new tool. We used a tool that is already C mark and then applied across all the different centers. And we did this in prostate cancers. We see that between the manual contouring tool that was applied in the delineation of pelvic lymph nodes, whereas an AI-assisted auto-segmented um, contour, then this essentially led to a, an improvement in accuracy from 0.76 to 0.9. And for the organs at risk, which is again a very tedious task uh, in terms of delineating the bladder and the rectum, this improved accuracy from 0.78 to 0.94. 
So this is quite powerful thinking that these are just actually very routine contours. As you would imagine, how difficult it is to draw the rectum or the, or the bladder. But we'll be very keen to see the results as it's applied in a hair and neck cancer setting. And so these are our inclusion criteria. We look at patients who will, will receive real therapy as a definitive treatment and patients who um, have undergone surgery We've excluded these patients for now because then the anatomy will have changed and we don't know whether AI could be adequately applied in this group of patients. Um, and so this is the study cohort across nine different clinics, in multiple countries, and we'll do a pre and post whereby we have got a manual segmentation as well as a washout period before then the clinicians will then edit the auto segmented um, contours that were delivered to them. And so to as ground truth, given that you know this are you know we have robust analysis for the contouring of the lymph nodes as well as the organs at risk. I think as opposed to the earlier study where we when it comes to contouring of gross tumor volume, there's less of a a ground truth because again that is depending on you know the the physician who has treated the most patients and whether there's consensus among them. I think the good thing about this study in this instance is that we have robust benchmarks uh, as a comparator. And so I'm pleased to say that this study has since been completed and we look forward to reporting the results in the early part of next year. I'll be very curious to see what the implementation actually is, uh, given that NCCS is one of the participating site and lead site for the study. And then I think this will then only provide further impetus for them for investigators worldwide as well as clinicians then really have some confidence to take this to the clinic. And so for the last part of my talk, I will briefly share about another sort of study that we're doing in terms of you know, applying AI technology to building data sets. And in this instance, a, a multi-centered hair and neck cancer study. So this is called the Tactic Study, for which I'm involved in. This study is endorsed by the Hair and Neck Cancer International Group, for which Singapore is a participating site. This involves 23 national countries where there's representation of each country. These countries are selected based on the fact that they've performed clinical trials before to qualify for membership in this organization. And working together with Savannah, which is a uh, NLP com a company where they are really sort of um, the expertise in is focused on using large language models to extract unstructured data from electronic health records to then basically have a seamless process to convert that to structured data sets for both research as well as building of real-world database. So we came together on this, on this collaboration to then identify sites to be part of this and the idea is to use EMR records to build structured database and then further proof the utility of this structured database to be able to help answer some of the questions that we've outlined uh, pertaining to hair and neck cancer and to then apply statistical models to answer questions on survival as well as treatment. And so this is the broad overview of how the utility of real world elements, um, you know, how it's being applied in, in research, which I won't, I won't sort of dwell into. And as a summary, the hair and neck cancer tactic study is intended to be a study of on artificial intelligence applied to electronic health records, then build a structured data set for hair and neck cancer. It, is, it has been launched in three different countries, Brazil, Spain, Portugal, and it's still to be launched in the US and the UK, where they're still undergoing approval. Um, and as you can imagine, because you know, we do have to target countries where English language is the main language of instruction, so we can't quite work with non-English um, data or, or annotated clinical notes yet. And the idea is then to apply the model that Savannah has developed, build this data set, and then try to you know, build predictive models of clinical response as well as disease progression. And here, we're focusing on HPV-positive oropharyngeal cancer. So this is the goal of the study. Um, in the locally advanced space, we are targeting patients with oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. Um, in the regions that we're targeting, in this group of patients, we see a very strong link with the human papilloma virus, 
So it's another viral associated cancers. And we see this cancer dominating about 70 to 80% of hair neck cancers that are seen in these communities today. So we hope to be able to do the same exercise as what we did for MPC, build a dynamic risk model to predict recurrence or disease progression, given that these patients right now, what we see is that there is a clear dichotomy in terms of progression. We have a group of patients who are low risk and where they behave very well to either chemotherapy or and radiation combined. And then there's also a group of high-risk patients where despite intensive surgery and chemo radiation, they still progress. Now, in another subset of patients uh, in the recurrent metastatic space, we have seen the role of immunotherapy transform the care of these patients and the outcome of these patients. So here, we wanted, we thought it'd be nice to then you know, develop a, a, a data set that may then allow us to identify patient features that can then predict long-term survival after immunotherapy. I think from a healthcare provider point of view, this is an important question to answer given the cost of immunotherapy, which may be prohibitive in some countries. So I think, you know, we hope that this exercise or this research could help us answer some of the real world questions using real world data set. And the idea is then applying an NLP or large language models to accelerate this building of this data set. And so this is an example, I won't belabor the details here. Um, and this is a study design, how we've decided to go about, whereby we delineate a study protocol among the steering committee, identify the fields they want to extract, then use that, map that to this unstructured data. Um, and this is entirely led by Savannah using a cloud-based system. And then once the data is done, we will then, among the clinicians, do a quality assurance before the analysis is then undertaken. And so this is again an a, a, a example. And so with that, I would like to summarize the, some of the key points I've shared in the last sort of 40 minutes or so. I think, I hope I've shown you good tangible examples of how there are several opportunities, and we call it big data, but in reality, it's really sort of real world data that is painstakingly collected by human or by machine, if you want to see it. And then the idea is then apply a clinical lens to then help us understand some of the trajectories, nuances of the phenotypes, to then translate that information to improve the top process of how we treat patients in the clinic. And I think that is the most immediate translation we can think of. Automation can certainly help us do things better. Time is just one aspect of it. I think the consistency is one key task. You know, we talk about heterogeneity between clinical practice across different ecosystems. I think that is a problem and a key source of differences in outcomes. And I think automation can certainly help in that regard. And I think there are other facets of AI which you'll see going forward. And here today, I'll only talk about uh, NLP, but I think if we look in terms of, you know, chat GPT and all that, I mean, it will only help us think about how do we integrate the multiple domains of data that I showed you in my first slide, you know, the abundance of data that we collect today, you know, all that could certainly help us, you know, refine and streamline processes. And, you know, ideally for every patient, we give them one survival rate and then that's met to the different type of treatments they can receive. And that would help uh, better inform the physician and the patient to make a decision that's best for them. And so with that, I hope it's been informative. Thank you for having me again and you know, welcome any questions. This is a, 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 a picture that's taken of Finland in summer. So I can, I've been using that for all my talks. I can't find a better way to actually end any of the talks that I give. And thank you again for having me. Thanks so much, Melvin. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's it's really um, great to see how much your contribution towards, you know, um, big data as well as all the um, the collaborations that you've been having with so many of the people, not just in Southeast Asia, but just across the world with regard to all these um, sort of um, clinical data um, um, in all these different countries and different ecosystems. Um, I think while the rest of the questions start to um, fill in, uh, I think Dr. Soon actually from, uh, yeah, and Tiana has actually have a question with regards to whether or not um, risk stratification guides radiation treatment volume. 
Um, um, I think you mentioned it a little bit in your talk um, just now, but I think perhaps you'd like to take this question uh, live in person first. I think so. You know, thanks, uh, Young, for asking a question. I think, you know, in theory you could, but I think that what I showed you is just the tip of the iceberg because we, we clearly would want to go into, you know, even finer endpoints like differences between local relapse versus distant relapse, local and distant relapse. And if we are then able to then not just look at disease-free survival as a composite endpoint and then have a data set that, or, or database that is, you know, even more refined and allows us to understand, you know, who are the patients that have a early local relapse. And then with that, it may then help inform about how we will want to tailor our radiation treatment. For example, um, you know, we know that patients, a lot of these patients receive induction chemotherapy today. And so, you know, as we think about how do we plan our radiation for this post-systemic therapy patients, do we use the same dose, the same volume as though it is pre-chemotherapy? I think this is one big question to state. Should we use a differential dose to the tumor that has shrunk, you know, post systemic therapy, and then what is remaining gets a radiation boost. I mean, that would seem intuitive. So we have started some of this practice. And the beauty of having this data warehouse is everything else that you collect adds to this. And then over time, you're then not only be able to look at a composite outcome, you're able to map the outcomes relative to the different eras, map to the different treatments that you receive. And then that allows you to then think about, okay, based on these practices, do I see a difference in pattern of relapse? So I think I, I see this as an iterative process to help basically, you know, feedback to what we do in the clinic. And as opposed to just waiting for clinical trials data to come out, which may or may not be performed. Thanks, Melvin. Um, I think we also do have another question. I think Dr. Lee has mm. just asked um, that systemic treatment uh, regimen changes all the time. Once you validate a model, how do you keep the model useful? That's precisely my point. I think the, you know, so I think that's where the clinical lens is important. Now, you know, we've done this, we've all done this before, right? You know, you, you use ML to build a model, you put a thousand parameters in there, you put a hundred parameters in there, it comes out with a model that's potentially most accurate. Now, of course, you know, one would then have to look through the different parameters that are, are included, whether they are redundancy, whether it makes any clinical sense. And so I think that process is important. Now, why that so is because when you think about building a model that you want to use in a clinic, I think if you, the way I see it is that you would need a, you would need a model at baseline. So if I do a model that's based on baseline parameters, I may not actually put treatment in there because you want things that are obtainable a priori to treatment that can help you then think about how does this certify the patient's risk. And then putting to the point on the treatment change over time, then you could have a model that is based on longitudinal treatment response. And then that can then influence another layer of treatment decision making that can occur you know, one or two months into the treatment. And so for that, that actually might be treatment dependent. So in that way, when you think about it, you know, in that, in that manner, then it's a different exercise entirely, whether you want to build on, you know, what you want to do, what sort of model you want for baseline certification, whereas what kind of model you want for on-treatment certification and its dependencies. So I think, I think it's very important for the human to be engaged in this process. Okay, um, I, I think we're actually going to um, reach the end of the talk already, but I just wanted to throw in one question because it's one of the questions that someone had actually texted me directly. Um, I think a lot of um, the people in this talk are not just a radiation oncologist, but also across all the different departments. I think someone actually wanted to ask a little bit more about the application and, or, or rather um, the, the implementation of actually real-world data. Like how do you go about doing it? How do you collect it? And how do you go about you know, making sure that whatever data that you have, you actually understand it and is able to translate to some sort of clinical practice? Um, perhaps, Melvin, I, I mean, um, I, I know it's impossible to summarize the entire process that you've taken over the years on how you actually get the real-world data and all the conversation they have with all the different deep, um, governments and ecosystems. But perhaps um, you could just give a, a shot of a, a brief summary 
And in a way, um, also maybe tell the, some of the audience, um, for those who are interested in actually using real world data in their own um, sort of specialty, what would be the lowest hanging fruit that you think potentially can be obtained um, if they are interested to step into that field? I mean, I mean, that's a great question. I, I mean, I think, you know, and I obviously could only touch on it very briefly. Um, it does take time. I think the key thing is not to be overly ambitious. You know, when we did the MPC exercise, I mean, the, the motivation behind that was, you know, over the years, you've seen an abundance of literature sort of reporting on neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, LDH, EDV, DNA, and all this different markers. But do we actually use any of this in the clinic? And what does it take to convince a clinician to use it in the clinic? And for me, you know, given my motivation and my involvement in science, it, it makes the most sense that, hey, let's collect this data, you know, and start collecting them, you know, going back in time, acknowledging, acknowledging that if you use, you know, if you look at retrospective data sets, then you will have to deal with data missingness, which you can address it, you know, come through bar statistical tools and all that. Um, but to just collect them, and then decide on a set of data fields that you think can help inform you on your process and then collect it prospectively. And then once you have, you know, an, an idea of a, a reasonable data set that you have collated, then start answering some of the key questions, right? It's important to then work with someone who is, you know, who's competent in coding, who's competent in biostatistics, because you then have to look at how the raw data lays out Think about data transformation, think about data cleaning. And then once you have a snapshot of the raw data, you'll never other, ever undermine the process. Then think about what are the data time points you want to use to then you know, draw on them to then look at then associations with outcomes or what you're doing in the clinic. You know, one example that we did was we looked at longitudinal EBV DNA response. And we know that the delay, patients who delay their clearance are not great. We did that based on real world data. It wasn't based on the trial data. And with that, we actually went on to design a prospective trial to validate our findings. I think that, you know, briefly speaks on that process, you know, because ultimately the database that you build has to answer the question that is most burning, you know, to the program, to the clinical, you know, division. So I think that's how I would sort of advise and share. Uh, and once you see the fruits and the, the, the robustness of such a, a warehouse that you create, then the rest of it is really, is, is fairly straightforward because, you know, and today we use it routinely in the clinic, you know, for, we try to, for every patient who walks in, your age group, given your T and N, even though the numbers may be, you know, much smaller because when you start dissecting in the smaller groups, then of course you're dealing with a wider confidence interval. We acknowledge that, but it's a starting point. Then you give a much accurate, um, you know, statistical estimate to the outcomes to a patient. And that is born from the results in your specific center. I think that's extremely important. Okay, um, I'm mindful of time. We have started at 104 and it's 204, so it's exactly one hour. Um, thank you very much, Melvin, for having this um, um, talk and for gracing the seminar today. Um, to all the rest of the participants, um, um, there is a question, I think Glenn just put in, uh, thank you very much, Glenn. Um, there is a QR code right now. Um, please do uh, scan the QR code and um, fill out the survey to help us planning with any future Global Health Seminar series. Um, with that, I come to the end of the session today. Once again, thank you very much for your attention and thank you very much, Melvin, for gracing us um, with your presence today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.